Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is Global Compliance Panel and welcome to a live webinar on uh, Auditing Analytical Laboratories for FTA Compliance. And I'm David, your host today. And on behalf of our team, I would like to say thank you for being part of this event. And um, I would like to inform all participants that if you get logged out of this training session or the teleconference, uh, we request everyone to follow the same procedure to join in again. Our presenter today is um, Stephen Kuhara. Uh, Dr. Kuhara is the founder and principal of GXP Biotechnology, LLC. He holds degrees in biochemistry from Cornell and the University of Wisconsin. Uh, now, with over 30 years of experience, Dr. Kuhara is an experienced analytical biochemist who has applied his academic knowledge to quality control in the pharmaceutical industry and also in dealing with all aspects of GMP and GLP in relation to biopharmaceuticals. He has worked with small molecules, proteins, cells, gene therapy, vectors, and nutritional supplements. Uh, Dr. Kuwahara has written several papers and book chapters and serves on the editorial advisory boards of BioPharm, BioQuality, and the Journal of GXP Compliance. He has held certifications as a CQA, CQT, and CQE from the American Society of Quality and was certified RAC by the Regulatory Affairs Professional Society. And we are really honored to have uh, such a distinguished person, uh, such as doc Dr. Kohara with us. Now, before we begin, I would like to inform you of the program outline for this training session. Uh, the webinar is for 90 minutes duration. First, Dr. Kohara will take you through today's webinar, highlighting the areas that would be covered, and he would then share with you his presentation. Uh, we also request all to hold back your questions until the Q&A window begins. Ten minutes of time will be allotted for the Q&A, during which your questions will be answered. I hope everyone is ready to start today's session. Um, I request Dr. Kuhara to take it from here. Stephen? Thank you very much, David. Um, the subject of today's webinar is auditing analytical laboratories. And um, although the title says for FDA compliance, I will point out that a lot of the auditing principles that we will discuss, discuss today would apply if you are auditing for other types of compliance uh, besides just FDA. <clears throat> Even uh, European or international compliance would be uh, covered under some of the things that we're going to talk about. Now, the thing about auditing laboratories, um, think of this as though you're auditing a manufacturing plant. Those of you who have experience as auditors, uh, really dealing with a laboratory is not that much different from dealing with a manufacturing plant. The lab takes samples, produces test, its products are test results. And uh, the waste would constitute the leftover samples, used reagents, et cetera. And, you know, one of the things you do need to look at in an, in an audit is uh, what happens to these leftover samples and used reagents. How do they, do they dispose of these things? Uh, do they just dump them down the drain? Or do they have a good way of dis, uh, disposing of these substances? The handling of the test data is sort of a process and it's a process similar to that of handling products. You use equipment <clears throat> like a manufacturing plant. You have batch records, <clears throat> excuse me. And uh, you know, remember when you're using instruments, the instruments should be treated as though they were manufacturing equipment. In other words, you should have a log book for each instrument that tells tells you what you know the history of that instrument, and so basically, uh, and then when they do an assay validation, <clears throat> it's basically the same as a process validation. the The object of the whole thing is to show that the procedure is suitable for its intended purpose. Now there are several types of laboratories, and uh, these laboratories are subclassified because some of them are very specific. They only do straight chemical or they only do biological testing. Uh, some do only physical testing, whereas others would do clinical type samples and so on and so forth. Uh, you can run into a laboratory that actually has only one major piece of equipment, like for instance an X-ray fluorometer, and all of their work is done. Uh, for x-ray fluorescence. And a lot of times uh, 
you know, these small laboratories actually create problems for you because they're not as compliant as the larger labs. Now, you have the independent labs. These are usually commercial or nonprofit labs. They're not associated with any other company. Um, they're just labs. And um, in many cases, we end up using these people where we need either a third neutral third party or we just need additional help for our company. You have company labs. Uh, usually they're within a large company. And also sometimes a small startup will have a company lab um, mainly dealing with the specific product that they're making. And they don't seem to realize in many cases that there are many types of tests that need to be run if you're producing a pharmaceutical product. There are university or institute uh, laboratories that are associated with universities. And some of these are service labs like in university associated hospitals and the like. I will warn you that history has shown that the rate of compliance at universities or at institutes associated with universities are not really good. In fact, a lot of the GLP problems that have occurred have occurred at university laboratories. Also, you have government laboratories, and usually you don't audit a government laboratory, um, mainly because you know they, they're the boss. Um, they're the regulators, but sometimes they will invite you to visit them and uh, see what they do. And uh, for instance, when I first got into the ind industry, I actually went to FDA to learn how they did a certain test procedure. And, uh, you know, I was invited there by FDA and because, they, you know, they, they try to help. And, um, you know, I did spend some nice time down in Bethesda going to the, into the FDA labs. Now, there are no perfect labs. Um, some of them want you to think that they are, and you will, you know, you'll notice this in their presentations or their attitude. But uh, just remember, nobody's perfect. And um, there's always something that needs to be fixed. Now, regardless of the type of lab that you're going to audit, there's niceties. You know, first of all, try not to do a hostile or adversarial audit unless you really suspect a violation. And, um, and by a violation, I'm not necessarily saying violation of the, um, of the regulations because the regulation for your purposes, various regulations may not be all that important, although you want compliance. Uh, but, you know, if they're not following it exactly, this, this is like, you know, your father, okay, so he speeds when he drives down the freeway. Um, yeah, you, you know, you're concerned about it and you know that he could get caught by the cops and all this. But at the same time, uh, at least if you're sensible, you're not going to get real hostile or adversarial about it. Now, if you have, and the problem here would be your company's principles or your company's needs. If you've spelled out something in a contract and you say you must do this, and you figure out that the lab may not be doing exactly that, then you may have a reason to have an adversarial audit. But even there, you know, it might be better to hire a third party rather than have a direct confrontation between you and the laboratory. The, um, remember, only an enforcement entity like a government body has, um, has the so-called right to invade their, their premises. Now, the best audits are going to be informational. Um, what you do is you use the audit to build a relationship between your company and the contract laboratory, for instance. And basically, what you, you, you know, it's sort of like going to visit somebody. You kind of want to see how they live and what they do and what kind of people they really are and all that sort of stuff and build confidence in each other 
have them develop some confidence that they're not dealing with a bunch of nuts. And on your side, you want to be confident that you're not dealing with a bunch of nuts. And so you want to build a relationship between your two companies and at the same time assure yourself that there are no major problems at, your, at the other laboratory. You should pre-announce your intention to audit. Again, you know, um, even FDA doesn't show up on a surprise audit unless they have reason to believe there's something really bad going on. And um, the problem with surprise audits is that you may think you're being clever, but you may catch them, well, not only completely off guard, but you may show up, for instance, on a day when they're having the company picnic or something like that. And um, it really, you know, sort of follows up the purpose of your audit, and you don't get the information you need. Usually, you try and set it up, send a letter, be flexible. Uh, you, if you want to see something specific, you should say so in your letter, because, um, you know, if it's just sort of a general audit, they might not be doing what you want to see or the person that you want to talk to may not be there. And you have to kind of judge how long that audit will need to last and it will kind of depend upon what you need to do. Some of you will want to run very thorough audits whereas others, you know, you're not too concerned about the people, you just want to know that they're not doing something grossly wrong in which case um, you, you may not go for an in-depth audit. And the difference I'm talking about here is this. In an in-depth audit, I mean, you really sit there and you go through all of their records, their SOPs, uh, especially with work related to any contract that you may have with these people. Whereas on a superficial or just a routine audit, you go through the facility, you spot check one or two records, um, look at a few SOPs, talk to the employees, and sort of just get a develop a general feel. And part of the general feel is, of course, looking for specific things. And if you find a whole bunch of small things, you might sort of suspect that maybe there is um, something major that's wrong with, this, with the uh, company. Now, you may suggest when you, know, you want to have the audit. You, usually, you would be at least a month away. Um, it, it's kind of interesting because upper management quite often will tell you, well, you know, why can't you go out next week? Um, it might be that that next week is not only inconvenient for you, but it might be very inconvenient for the for the laboratory. So have some time to prepare, set up, establish a date for the audit. Usually, what you'll do is you'll suggest, oh, say the the latter half of a particular month. You know, this being the end of April, you might say something like, "I'd like to come in." either the end of May or the, or the early, early part of June or something like that, and then ask them to you know, pick a, a date that would be convenient for them as well as for you, or to suggest two or three dates. The, uh, tell them what you're interested in and what lab you're interested in seeing. The, uh, there have been several cases of auditors who have shown up at company headquarters only to find out that the lab that they really want to see is located at a at a division you know several hundred miles away. Also, talk to the head of the laboratory that you want to go and see, or the head of the quality unit that's responsible for that audit and tell them what standards you're going to be using for the audit. For instance, there are the GLP regulations or which of the GMP regulations you're going to be using. Um, are you going to be doing a general USP you know, against the um, specifications in the USP? ISO 17025 is sort of a general um, standard for laboratory.